This text is educated by Tara Westover. Today we are reading pages 228 to 243, which are pages 95 to 102 in our text PDFs. I'd come to BYU to study music, so that one day I could direct a church choir. But that semester, the fall of my junior year, I didn't enroll in a single music course. I couldn't have explained why I dropped advanced music theory in favor of geography and comparative politics, or gave up sightseeing to take history of the Jews. But when I seen those courses in the catalog and read their titles aloud, I had felt something infinite, and I wanted a taste of that infinity. For four months, I attended lectures on geography and history and politics. I learned about Margaret Thatcher and the 38th parallel and the Cultural Revolution. I learned about parliamentary politics and electoral systems around the world. I learned about the Jewish diaspora and the strange history of the protocols of elders of Zion. By the end of the semester, the world felt big, and it was hard to imagine returning to the mountain, to the kitchen, or even to a piano in the room next to the kitchen. This caused a kind of crisis in me. My love of music and my desire to study it had been compatible with my idea of what a woman is. My love of history and politics and world affairs was not, and yet they called to me. A few days before finals, I sat for an hour with my friend Josh in an empty classroom. He was reviewing his applications for law school. I was choosing my courses for the next semester. If you were a woman, I asked, would you still study law? Josh didn't look up. If I were a woman, he said, I wouldn't want to study it. But you've talked about nothing except law school for as long as I've known you, I said. It's your dream, isn't it? It is, he admitted, but it wouldn't be if I were a woman. Women are made differently. They don't have this ambition. Their ambition is children. He smiled at me as if I knew what he was talking about. And I did. I smiled, and for a few seconds, we were in agreement. Then, but what if you were a woman, and somehow you felt exactly as you do now? Josh's eyes fixed on the wall for a moment. He was really thinking about it. Then he said, I'd know something was wrong with me. I'd been wondering whether something was wrong with me since the beginning of the semester, when I'd attended my first lecture on world affairs. I'd been wondering how I could be a woman and yet be drawn to unwomanly things. I knew someone must have the answer, so I decided to ask one of my professors. I chose a professor of my Jewish history class because he was quiet and soft-spoken. Dr. Carey was a short man with dark eyes and a serious expression. He lectured in a thick wool jacket even in hot weather. I knocked on his office door quietly as I hoped he wouldn't answer and soon was sitting silently across from him. I didn't know what my question was, and Dr. Carey didn't ask. Instead, he posed general questions about my grades or courses I was taking. He asked why I'd chosen Jewish history, and without thinking, I brought it out that I'd learned of the Holocaust only a few semesters before and wanted to learn the rest of the story. You learned of the Holocaust when, he said, at BYU. They didn't teach you about it in your school? They probably did, I said, only I wasn't there. Where were you? I explained as best as I could that my parents didn't believe in public education, that they kept us home. When I finished, he laced his fingers as if he were contemplating a difficult problem. I think you should stretch yourself, see what happens. Stretch myself how? He leaned forward suddenly, as if he just had an idea. Have you heard of Cambridge? I hadn't. It's a university in England, he said. One of the best in the world. I organized a study abroad program there for students. It's highly competitive and extremely demanding. You might not be accepted, but if you are, it may give you some idea of your abilities. I walked to my apartment, wondering what to make of the conversation. I wanted moral advice, someone to reconcile my calling as a wife and mother with the call I heard of something else. But he put that aside. He'd seem to say, first find out what you are capable of, then decide who you are. I applied to the program. Emily was pregnant. The pregnancy was not going well. She nearly miscarried in the first trimester, and now that she was approaching 20 weeks, she was beginning to have contractions. Mother, who was a midwife, had given her St. John's wort and other remedies. The contractions lessened but continued. When I arrived at Buck's Peak for Christmas, I expected to find Emily on bed rest. She wasn't. She was standing at the kitchen counter straining herbs along with half a dozen other women. She rarely spoke and smiled even more rarely just moved about the house carrying vats of cramped bark and motherwort. She was quiet to the point of invisibility, and after a few minutes, I forgot she was there. It had been six weeks since the explosion, and while Dad was back on his feet, it was clear he would never be the man he was. He would scarcely walk across his room without gasping for air, so damaged were his lungs. The skin on his lower face had regrown, 
but it was thin and waxy as if someone had taken sandpaper and rubbed it to the point of transparency. His ears were thick with scars. He had thin lips and his mouth drooped, giving him the haggard appearance of a much older man. But it was his right hand, more than his face, that drew stares. Each finger was frozen in its own pose, some curled, some bowed, twisting together in a gnarled claw. He could hold a spoon by wedging it between his index finger, which bowed upward, and his ring finger, which curved downward. But he ate with difficulty. I wonder whether skin grafts could have achieved what mother had with her comfrey and loblia salve. It was a miracle, everyone said, so that was the new name they gave mother's recipe. After dad's burn, it was known as miracle salve. At dinner, my first night on the peak, dad described the explosion as a tender mercy from the Lord. It was a blessing, he said. A miracle God spared my life and extended me to a great calling, to testify of his power, to show people there's another way besides the medical establishment. I watched as he tried and failed to wedge his knife tightly enough to cut his roast. I was never in any danger, he said. I'll prove it to you. As soon as I can walk across the yard without near passing out, I'll get a torch and cut off another tank. The next morning when I came out for breakfast, there was a crowd of women gathered around my father. They listened with hushed voices and glistening eyes as Dad told of the heavenly visitations he received while hovering between life and death. He had been ministered to by angels, he said, like the prophets of old. There was something in the way the woman looked at him, something like adoration. I watched the women throughout the morning and became aware of the change my father's miracle had wrought in them. Before, the woman who worked for my mother and had always approached her casually with matter-of-fact questions about their work, now their speech was soft, admiring. Dramas broke out between them as they vied for my mother's esteem and for my father's. The change could be summed up simply. Before, they had been employees. Now, they were followers. The story of Dad's burn became something of a founding myth. It was told over and over to newcomers, but also to the old. In fact, it was rare to spend an afternoon in the house without hearing some kind of citation of the miracle, and occasionally, these were citations were less than accurate. I heard Mother tell a room of the road of faces that 65% of Dad's upper body had been burned to the third degree. That was not what I remembered. In my memory, the bulk of the damage had been skin deep. His arms, back, and shoulders had hardly been burned at all. It was only his lower face and hands that had been third degree. But I kept this to myself. For the first time, my parents seemed to be of one mind. Mother no longer moderated Dad's statements after he left the room, no longer quietly gave her own opinion. She had been transformed by the miracle, transformed into him. I remember her as a young midwife, so cautious, so meek about the lives over which she had such power. There was little of that meekness in her now. The Lord himself guided her hands, and no misfortune would occur except by the will of God. A few weeks after Christmas, the University of Cambridge wrote to Dr. Carey rejecting my application. The competition was very steep, Dr. Carey told me when I visited his office. I thanked him and stood to go. One moment, he said. Cambridge instructed me to write if I felt there were any gross injustices. I didn't understand, so he repeated himself. I could only help one student, he said. They have offered you a place if you want it. It seemed impossible that I would really be allowed to go. Then I realized that I would need a passport and that without a real birth certificate, I was unlikely to get one. Someone like me did not belong at Cambridge. It was as if the universe understood this and was trying to prevent the blasphemy of my going. I applied in person. The clerk laughed out loud at my delayed birth certificate. Nine years, she said. Nine years is not a delay. Do you have any other documentation? Yes, I said. But they have different birth dates. Also, one has a different name. She was still smiling. Different date and different name. No, that's not going to work. There's no way you're going to get a passport. I visited the clerk several more times, becoming more and more desperate until finally a solution was found. My Aunt Debbie visited the courthouse and swore an affidavit that I was who I said I was. I was issued a passport. In February, Emily gave birth. The baby weighed one pound, four ounces. When Emily had started having contractions at Christmas, mother had said the pregnancy would unfold according to God's will. His will, it turned out, was that Emily give birth at home at 26 weeks gestation. There was a blizzard that night, one of those mighty mountain storms that clears the roads and closes the towns. Emily was in the advanced stages of labor when mother realized she needed a hospital. The baby, which they named Peter, appeared a few minutes later, slipping from Emily so easily that mother said she caught him more than delivered him. He was still in the color of ash. Sean thought he was dead. Then mother felt a tiny heartbeat. Actually, she saw his heart beating through a thin film of skin. My father rushed to the van and began scraping at the snow and ice. 
Sean carried Emily and laid her on the back seat. Then mother placed the baby against Emily's chest and covered him, creating a makeshift incubator. Kangaroo care, she called it later. My father drove, the storm raged. In Idaho, we call it a whiteout. When the wind whips the snowfall so violently it bleaches the road, covers it as if with a veil, and you can't see the asphalt or the fields or rivers. You can't see anything except billows of white. Somehow skidding through snow and sleet, they made it to town. But the hospital there was rural, unequipped to care for such a faint whimper of life. The doctor said they had to get him to Mickey D in Ogden as soon as possible. There was no time. He could not go by chopper because of the blizzard, so the doctors sent him in an ambulance. In fact, they sent him two ambulances, a second in case the first would come to the storm. Many months would pass, and countless surgeries on his heart and lungs would be performed before Sean and Emily would bring home the little twig of flesh that I was told was my nephew. By then, he was out of danger, but the doctors said his lungs might never develop fully. He might always be frail. Dad said God had orchestrated the birth just as he had orchestrated the explosion. Mother echoed him, adding that God had placed a veil over her eyes so she wouldn't stop the contractions. Peter was supposed to come into the world this way, she said. He is a gift from God, and God gives his gifts in whatever way he chooses. The first time I saw King's College, Cambridge, I didn't think I was dreaming, but only because my imagination had never produced anything so grand. My eyes settled on a clock tower with stone carvings. I was led to the tower, then we passed through it and into the college. There was a lake of perfectly clipped grass, and across the lake, an ivory-tinted building I vaguely recognized as Greco-Roman. But it was a gothic chapel, 300 feet long and 100 feet high a stone mountain that dominated the scene. I was taken past the chapel and into another courtyard, then up a spiral staircase. A door was opened and I was told that this was my room. I was left to make myself comfortable. The kindly man who had given me this instruction did not realize how impossible it was. Breakfast the next morning was served in a great hall. It was like eating in a church. The ceiling was cavernous and I felt under scrutiny, as if the hall knew I was there and I shouldn't be. I had chosen a long table full of other students from BYU. The women were talking about the clothes they had brought. Marianne had gone shopping when she learned she'd been accepted to the program. You need different pieces for Europe, she said. Heather agreed. Her grandmother had paid for her plane ticket, so she spent that money updating her wardrobe. The way people dress here, she said, it's more refined. You can't get away with jeans. I thought about rushing to my room to change out of the sweatshirt and kids I was wearing, but I had nothing to change into. I didn't even own anything like Marianne and Heather wore. Bright cardigans accented with delicate scarves. I hadn't brought new clothes to Cambridge because I'd had to take out a student loan just to pay the fees. Besides, I understood that even if I had Marianne's and Heather's clothes, I wouldn't know how to wear them. Dr. Carey appeared and announced that we'd been invited to take a tour of the chapel. We would even be allowed on the roof. There was a general scramble as we returned our trays and followed Dr. Carey from the hall. I stayed there at the back of the group as we made our way across the courtyard. When I stepped inside the chapel, my breath caught in my chest. The room, if such a space can be called a room, was voluminous as if it could hold the whole of the ocean. We were led through a small wooden door, then up a narrow spiraling staircase whose stone steps seemed numberless. Finally, the staircase opened onto the roof, which was heavily slanted, an inverted V enclosed by stone parapets. The wind was gusting and rolling clouds across the sky. The view was spectacular. The city miniaturized, utterly, dwarfed by the chapel. I forgot myself and climbed the slope then walked along the ridge, letting the wind take me as I stared out at the expanse of crooked streets and stone courtyards. You're not afraid of falling, a voice said. I turned. It was Dr. Carey. He had followed me, but seemed unsteady on his feet, nearly pitching with every rush of wind. We can go down, I said. I ran down the ridge to the flat walkway near the buttress. Again, Dr. Carey followed, but his steps were strange. Rather than walking face and forward, he rotated his body and moved sideways like a crab. The wind continued its attack. I offered him an arm for the last few steps, so unsteady did he seem, and he took it. I meant it as an observation, he said, when he'd made it down. Hey, you stand, upright hands in your pockets, he gestured towards the other students. See how they hunch, how they cling to the wall? He was right. A few were venturing onto the ridge, but they did so cautiously, taking the same ungainly side step Dr. Carey had, tipping and swinging in the wind. Everyone else was holding tight to the stone parapet, knees bent, backs arched, as if unsure whether to walk or crawl. I raised my hand and gripped the wall. You don't need to do that, he said. It's not a criticism. He paused as if unsure he should say more. Everyone has undergone a change, he said. The other students were relaxed until we came to this height. Now they are uncomfortable, on edge. You seem to have made the opposite journey. This is the first time I've seen you at home in yourself. It's in the way you move, as if you've been on this roof all your life. 
A gust of wind swept over the parapet and Dr. K retreated, clutching the wall. I stepped onto the bridge so he could flatten himself against the buttress. He stared at me, waiting for an explanation. I have roofed my share of hay sheds, I said finally. So your legs are stronger? Is that why you can stand in this wind? I had to think before I could answer. I can stand in this wind because I'm not trying to stand in it, I said. The wind is just wind. You could withstand these gusts on the ground, so you can withstand them in the air. There was no difference except the difference you make in your head. He stared at me blankly. He hadn't understood. I'm just standing, I said. You are all trying to compensate to get your bodies lower because the height scares you. But the crouching and the side-stepping are not normal. You have made yourself vulnerable. If you could just control your panic, this wind would be nothing. The way it is nothing to you, he said. I wanted the mind of a scholar. But it seemed that Dr. Carey saw in me the mind of a roofer. The other students belonged in a library. I belonged in a crane. The first week passed in a blur of lectures. In the second week, every student was assigned a supervisor to guide their research. My supervisor, I learned, was the eminent professor Jonathan Steinberg, a former vice master of a Cambridge college, who was much celebrated for his writings on the Holocaust. My first meeting with Professor Steinberg took place a few days later. I waited at the porter's lodge until a thin man appeared and, producing a set of heavy keys, unlocked a wooden door set into the stone. I followed him up a spiral staircase and into the clock tower itself, where there was a well-lit room with simple furnishings, two chairs, and a wooden table. I could hear the blood pounding behind my ears as I sat down. Professor Steinberg was in his 70s, but I would not have described him as an old man. He was leaf, and his eyes moved about the room with probing energy. His speech was measured and fluid. I'm Professor Steinberg, he said. What would you like to read? I mumbled something about historiography. I had decided to study not history, but historians. I suppose my interest came from the sense of groundlessness I felt since learning about the Holocaust and the Civil Rights Movement. Since realizing that what a person knows about the past is limited and will always be limited to what they were told by others. I knew what it was to have misconception corrected, a misconception of such magnitude that shifting it shifted the world. Now I need to understand how the great gatekeepers of history had come to terms with their own ignorance and partiality. I thought if I could accept that what they had written was not absolute, but was a result of a biased process of conversation and revision, maybe I could reconcile myself with the fact that the history that most people agreed upon was not the history I had been taught. That could be wrong, and the great historians Carlyle and Macaulay and Trevelyan could be wrong, but from the ashes of their dispute, I could not construct a world to live in. In knowing the ground was not ground at all, I hoped I could stand on it. I doubt I managed to communicate any of this. When I finished talking, Professor Steinberg eyed me for a moment, then said, Tell me about your education. Where did you attend school? The air was immediately sucked from the room. I grew up in Idaho, I said. And you attended school there? It occurs to me that in retrospect, someone might have told Professor Steinberg about me. Perhaps he perceived that I was avoiding his question, and that made him curious. Whatever the reason, he wasn't satisfied until I had admitted that I'd never been to school. How marvelous, he said, smiling. It's as if I stepped into Shaw's Pygmalion. For two months, I had weekly meetings with Professor Steinberg. I was never assigned readings. We read only what I asked to read, whether it was a book or a page. None of my professors at BYU had examined my writing the way Professor Steinberg did. No comma, no period, no adjective or adverb was beneath his interest. He made no distinction between grammar and content, between form and substance. A poorly written sentence was a poorly conceived idea. In his view, the grammatical logic was as much in need of correction. Tell me, he would say. Why have you placed this comma here? What relationship between these phrases are you hoping to establish? When I gave my explanation, sometimes he would say, quite right, and other times he would correct me with lengthy explanations of syntax. After I'd been meeting with Professor Steinberg for a month, he suggested I write an essay comparing Edmund Burke with Publius, the persona under which James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay had written the Federalist Papers. I really sat for two weeks. Every moment my eyes were open, I was either reading or thinking about those texts. From my father, I had learned that books were to be either adored or exiled. Books that were of God, books written by Mormon prophets or the Founding Fathers, were not to be studied so much as cherished, like a thing perfect in itself. I had been taught to read the words of men like Madison as a cast into which I ought to pour the plaster of my own mind to be reshaped according to the contours of their faultless model. I read them to learn what to think, not how to think for myself. Books that were not of God were banished. They were a danger, powerful and irresistible in their cunning. To write my essay, I had to read books differently without giving myself over to either fear or adoration. Because Burke had defended the British monarchy, Dad would have said he was an agent of tyranny. He wouldn't have wanted the book in the house. There was a thrill in trusting myself to read the words. I felt a similar thrill in reading Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, especially on those occasions when I discarded the conclusion in favor of Burke's.
but when it seemed to me that their ideas were not really different in substance, only in form. There were wonderful suppositions embedded in this method of reading, that books are not tricks and that I was not feeble. I finished the essay and sent it to Professor Steinberg. Two days later, when I arrived for our next meeting, he was subdued. He peered at me from across the table. I waited for him to say the essay was a disaster, the product of an ignorant mind, that if had overreached, drawn too many conclusions from too little material. I had been teaching in Cambridge for 30 years, he said, and this is one of the best essays I've read. I was prepared for intros, but not for this. Professor Steinberg must have said more about the essay, but I heard nothing. My mind was consumed with a wrenching need to get out of that room. In that moment, I was no longer in a clock tower in Cambridge. I was 17 in a red jeep, and a boy I loved had just touched my hand. I bolted. I could tolerate any form of cruelty but then kindness. Praise was poison to me. I choked on it. I wanted the professor to shout at me, wanted it so deeply I felt dizzy from the deprivation. The ugliness of me had to be given expression. If it was not expressed in his voice, I would need to express it in mine. I don't remember leaving the clock tower or how I passed the afternoon. That evening there was a black tie dinner. The hall was lit by candlelight, which was beautiful, but it cheered me for another reason. I wasn't wearing formal clothing, just a black shirt and black pants, and I thought people might not notice in the dim lighting. My friend Laura arrived late. She explained that her parents had visited and taken her to France. She only just returned. She was wearing a dress of rich purple with crisp pleats in the skirt. The hemline bounced several inches above her knee. For a moment, I thought the dress was whorish, until she said her father had bought it for her in Paris. A gift from one's father could not be whorish. A gift from one's father seemed to me the definitive signal that a woman was not a whore. I struggled with this dissonance. A whorish dress gifted to a loved daughter, until the meal had been finished and the plates had cleared away. At my best of revision, Professor Steinberg said that when I applied for graduate school, he would make sure I was accepted to whatever institution I chose. Have you visited Harvard, he said, or perhaps you prefer Cambridge? I imagined myself in Cambridge, a graduate student wearing a long black robe that swished as I strolled through ancient corridors. Then I was hunching in a bathroom, my arm behind my back, my head in the toilet. I tried to focus on the student, but I couldn't. I couldn't picture the girl in the long black gown without seeing that other girl. Scholar or whore, both could not be true. One was a lie. I can't go, I said. I can't pay the fees. Let me worry about the fees, Professor Steinberg said. In late August, on our last night in Cambridge, there was a final dinner in the Great Hall. The tables were set with more knives, forks, and goblets than I'd ever seen. The paintings on the wall seemed ghostly in the candlelight. I felt exposed by the elegance and yet somehow made invisible by it. I stared at the other students as they passed, taking in every silk dress, every heavily lined eye. I obsessed over the beauty of them. At dinner, I listened to the cheerful chatter of my friends while longing for the isolation of my room. Professor Steinberg was seated at the high table. Each time I glanced at him, I felt that old instinct at work in me, tensing my muscles, preparing me to take flight. I left the hall the moment dessert was served. It was a relief to escape all that refinement and beauty, to be allowed to be unlovely and not a point of contrast. Dr. Carey saw me leave and followed. It was dark. The lawn was black, the sky blacker. Pillars of chalky light reached up from the ground and illuminated the chapel, which glowed moonlike against the night sky. You've made an impression on Professor Steinberg, Dr. Carey said, following his step behind me. I only hope he has made some impression on you. I didn't understand. Come this way, he said, turning toward the chapel. I have something to say to you. I walked behind him, noticing the silence of my own footfalls, aware that my cats didn't click elegantly on stone the way that he was worn by the other girls did. Dr. Carey said he'd been watching me. You act like someone who's impersonating someone else, and it's as if you think your life depends on it. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing. It has never occurred to you, he said, that you might have as much right to be here as anyone. He waited for an explanation. I would enjoy serving the food, I said, more than eating it. Dr. Carey smiled. You should trust Professor Steinberg. If he says you're a scholar, pure gold, I heard him say, then you are. This is a magical place, I said. Everything shines here. You must stop yourself from thinking like that, Dr. Carey said, his voice raised. You are not fool's gold shining only under a particular light. Whomever you become, whatever you make yourself into, that is who you always were. It was always in you, not in Cambridge, in you. You are gold, and returning to BYU or even that mountain you came from will not change who you are. It may change how others see you. It may even change how you see yourself. Even gold appears dull in sunlighting, but that is the illusion, and it always was. I wanted to believe him, take his words and remake myself, but I'd never had that kind of faith. No matter how deeply I interred the memories, how tightly I shut my eyes against them, when I thought of myself, the images that came to mind were of that girl in the bathroom in the parking lot. I couldn't tell Dr. Carey about that girl. 
I couldn't tell him the reason I couldn't return to Cambridge was that being here threw into great relief every violent and degrading moment of my life. At BYU, I could almost forget, allow what had been to blend into what was. But the contrast here was too great. The world before my eyes too fantastical. The memories were more real, more believable than the stone spires. To myself, I pretended there were other reasons I couldn't belong at Cambridge. Reasons having to do with class and status. That it was because I was poor, had grown up poor. Because I could stand in the wind on the chapel roof and not tilt. That was a person who didn't belong in Cambridge. The roofer, not the whore. I can go to school, I had written in my journal that very afternoon. And I can buy new clothes, but I am still Tara Westover. I have done jobs no Cambridge student would do. Dresses any way you like, we are not the same. Clothes could not fix what was wrong with me. Something had rotted on the inside. Whether Dr. Carey suspected any part of this, I'm not sure. But he understood that I had fixated on clothes as a symbol of why I didn't and couldn't belong here. It was the last thing he said to me before he walked away, leaving me rooted, astonished beside the Green Chapel. The most powerful determinant of who you are is inside you, he said. Professor Steinberg says this is Pygmalion. Think of the story, Tara. He paused, his eyes fierce, his voice piercing. She was just a cockney in a nice dress until she believed in herself. Then it didn't matter what dress she wore.